will be kept off. Also, please feel free to type in your questions in the comment box or the Q&A box at the center bottom of your screen. Could you please add to your question which one of the panelists you're uh, addressing it to? And also, if you would like to speak, and then uh, if you would like me to read out the question to specify that, or if you're going to speak, then that's fine as well. Just uh, make it clear in the in the um, question or the comment. So this panel seeks to address the following questions: If not the nation, what alternative spatial categories can be implemented for writing the historical narratives of regions with a colonial past? How can we determine temporalities in this historical analysis beyond the dominance of the modern? How did colonialism shape, transform, and reform ideas and concepts produced within the empire? What forms of power hierarchies constitute the colonial within the global? Within these spaces, how does changing global and regional contexts affect ethno-religious community formations? And in what ways can, uh, can the global be situated within fractures of identity-based intersectional histories of race, caste, gender, and class? How can we think beyond the binaries of metropole, colony, colonizer, and colonized? <clears throat> so this wonderful panel will be chaired by Professor John Wilson, who's joined us from London this evening. He's a professor of modern history and vice dean of education in King's College London. He's, uh, he has also worked as a parliamentary researcher and uh, been a local councillor. Professor Wilson's work focuses on the everyday life of the state in South Asia, Britain, and beyond. His first book, The Dominance of Strangers, was a study of the emergence of a modern regime in Bengal during the late 18th, early 19th century. His second major project was on the British conquest of India and its implications for imperial and Indian politics. Um, I think the, the book is titled India Conquered, Britain's Raj and Chaos of Empire, uh, published uh, in September 2016. Professor Wilson is currently working on a multinational history of everyday concepts of the government from 1945 to the present, tracing particularly the rise and fall of ideas of national and democratic political power after the Second World War and end of empire. The project will result in a book whose provisional title is Out of Chaos, A Global History of the Rise and Fall of the Nation State. Our discussant for this evening is Dr. Gautam Chakraborty, who's an academic researcher and lecturer at the Faculty of Social and Cultural Sciences in Frankfurt, Germany. He's been a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Global Theater History, LMU Munich. He was also um, an honorary postdoctoral fellow at FU Berlin. He's taught English and comparative literature and Berlin and German studies at FU Berlin and University of Potsdam and South Asian studies at Humboldt University, Berlin. He's the co-editor of the upcoming volume, Performing the Cold War in Post-Colonial World, Theater, Film, Literature, and Things. Um, this book is tentatively pub to be published uh, later this year. Thank you so much for joining us, Gautam. I will now let Professor uh, Wilson take on from here. And uh, yeah, all yours. So, thank you, as I unmute myself um, in the usual uh, Zoom era. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to, to kind of uh, chair this uh, fascinating session. Apologies for the, um, the uh, slightly less salubrious environment I'm in. We're in the middle of doing work on our house, so you can see the building work in my background. Um, uh, we have a great uh, panel on, on a fascinating uh, set of questions relating to um, resistance and its relationship to intellectual history. And I um, will introduce uh, our four panellists in the order that they will speak. Um, Shruti Balaji from the London School of Economics, Shanjana Chowdhury from Texas Christian University, Madeleine Lafouz Lef from uh, City University New York, and Manashini Sen from the University of Hyderabad. Um, and I will um, hand over to, um, and, and so we'll, each, each speaker will have uh, 15 or so minutes, 12 to 15 minutes, um, I'll try to be quite rigorous on timing um, and uh, um, and then we'll have half an hour or so for a conversation afterwards and um, Gautam will, will kick off the conversation with, with comments. Um, so let me hand over to uh, Shruti to start with, um, with a paper entitled Towards a Historical Conception of Women's International Thought. Shruti. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, thanks also to Shivatri for um, hosting uh, what's been a fabulous set of events over the last couple of days. Um, it's, it's all um, come out really well. So thanks also for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm going to speak for way less than 15 minutes. So <laughs> hopefully timekeeping won't be a problem. Um, I'd just like to first say that this presentation today 
is a portion of my larger doctoral project, which is situated in critical international relations. And uh, what I'm sharing today is some of the conceptual thinking that I've been doing prior to my archival work on this project. Um, so for this reason, this particular presentation focuses on the stakes and conceptual framing of my project rather than the empirical substance or archives themselves. But I'm very happy to talk through some of the archival stuff that's been going on in the Q&A if it comes up. Um, so my PhD project was motivated by my deep dissatisfaction with the ways in which global and international women's histories have been treated as separate, distinct, or peripheral to the emergence and continued generation of international thought and politics, both in its conventional and anti-colonial stance, and what we lose because of this separation. So crucially, my doctoral project critically engages with the question, how can we understand and theorize Indian women's thought and activism within anti-imperial international networks in the early to mid 20th century? I hope to demonstrate through this project how Indian women's thinking and international activism was crucial in the early production of international thought. So conventionally, international political thought and participation has been viewed and theorized as the domain of men and masculinized ideals. This view that are taken for granted understanding of political concepts and knowledges are derived primarily from the public participation of men is reflected in present day global international and intellectual history projects. The implication is that men are knowledge bearers and creators, and as a consequence, our theoretical conceptions and epistemological roots are directly derived from the experiences, thought, ideas, and ways of knowing that have been passed down from and by men. Concurrently, there's also been an epistemological bias of Eurocentrism in scholarship in, on international thought that often portrays Western international thought as universal thought, which is often traced unproblematically from Hobbes, Locke, Kant, Rousseau, and so on in a straight line. So this ties into the notion that the non-Western subject can only know oneself, while the West has the right to legitimate and universal knowledge production, as various post-colonial scholars have pointed out previously. Now this latter epistemological bias has been remedied to an extent. We now have a rich and growing tradition of international history projects that squarely locate empire and colonial relations as central to the production of international political ideas. I'm thinking most recently of Adam Getich's work on world making after empire, but also many other such um, scholars alongside her. These incredibly rich, rich set of interventions that take empire seriously as a site of international ideas still remain inherently masculinist in their understandings of the origins of international intellectual thought. So my doctoral project seeks specifically um, to respond to this question. Using a post-colonial feminist theory framework, I explore how Indian women were active through their travels, writings, and resistances in transnational networks, which in turn has had an impact on international politics. In this particular chapter that I'm presenting today, I firstly argue that a careful reading of a plethora of cross archival resources is indicative of how these historical Indian women's imperial experiences were both a lived reality and a pivotal space for rethinking competing visions of the international. Secondly, I argue that there is a need to situate Indian women's political thought and writings within larger and broader anti-imperial contexts, rather than only seeing them as being nativist, nationalist, or domestically centered. Doing so helps to demonstrate that Indian women's international thinking is constitutive of international thought, if we take the international to also be imperial historically. Ultimately, I contend that taking colonial Indian women's international ideas seriously requires a commitment to rethink ontological, epistemological, and methodological ways of questioning who counts as an international thinker and what counts as international intellectual thought itself. Importantly, my project is not simply concerned with adding women to existing canons, stories, and narratives as a retrospective corrective. As Joan Scott has pointed out, the study of women not only adds new subject matter to history, but also forces a critical re-examination of the premises and standards of existing scholarly work. 
So to make this case empirically and inductively, I've been working with a rich and wide ranging set of archival and primary sources of written work, speeches, articles, monographs, memoirs, personal correspondences, annual organizational reports and journal publications, among other sources of Indian women's writing. I am particularly interested in Indian women who were civil society activists and anti-colonial nationalists in the late colonial um, era in India, um, circa 1920 to 1960. These women were also part of a larger network of feminist and polit women political actors at the international level, especially through their presence in domestic political organizations such as the All India Women's Conference, as well as international anti-imperial solidarity networks, both personal and institutional. I'm going to spend the rest of the time I have to ask, what do we get from reading historical third world women, particularly in my case, Indian women's international thought that takes history as situated knowledge and considers it to be a result of thick social relations, including imperial relations. Such readings do not only question feminist political theory and international relations' own genealogy and origin story, but also enable me to point to alternative ideas, thought and practices that underpin political processes and foreshadowed existing debates on anti-imperial and feminist international politics. Secondly, such a reading acknowledges systemic forces, but importantly pays attention to individual agency and action, thus also remaining wary of overdetermined totalizing projects of global history, which is fairly common in international relations. Um, I also take from Antoinette Burton the idea that these South Asian women may have lived and experienced empire differently. So both uh, uh, experienced empire differently, both from imperial women in Britain, but also male intellectuals in their own region and elsewhere. This is what Burton calls the double exclusion of imperial relations and patriarchy, which are necessarily read as hierarchical, racialized, gendered, and colonial. At the same time, these women were at a position of being uniquely marginalized and privileged. So they were being spoken on on behalf of by Western women and simultaneously were speaking on behalf of Indian and Asian women. Following the works of feminist political theorist Claire Hemings and the gender historian Joan Scott, my reading of historical figures will engage with, rather than write away, contradictions, paradoxes, and strategic essentialisms within Indian women's thought and writing. Um, I, I think this opens up interesting questions as to to what extent and in what ways were these Indian women differing in their international ideas and theory from Indian male intellectuals such as Gandhi and Nehru, who are so often thought of as international um, intellectual thinkers. Secondly, is there an evidence of parallel attempts being made by these women to articulate alternative conceptions, and by alternative, I mean differing from taken for granted uh, accounts of global and imperial histories um, of international progress, and did they have alternative visions um, for the world at the point at which they were thinking? Such excavation of political thought and action could potentially give us under-theorized radical forms of political imagination, which do have deep implications for our present and future. Um, I'd like to conclude by just sharing a couple of aspects of my project, which I think speaks uh, more generally to this panel and resonated with me as I was going through some of the other um, papers. Firstly, I think my paper calls into question this distinction that we hold between the national and the international and the blurriness of these concepts. Um, one of the interventions that I haven't developed in this paper, but is quite central to my work, is the qu a questioning of the possibilities and limits of Indian women's anti-imperial thought. So we do have a flurry of anti-imperial solidarities in the early to mid 20th century. And there are a, a burgeoning set of literatures that support and argue that this is the case. But for South Asian uh, political and international theorists, as well as historians, there seems to be a consensus that this uh, movement away from in internationalism, be it liberal internationalism, feminist internationalism, anti-colonial internationalisms to a post-colonial nation state uh, mo moment 
with a whole new set of political challenges is a need to transition. So we, we do have these anti-imperial solidarities between the 1930s and 50s, and post the 50s, all of this seems to be flattened out into nationalistic agendas and politics and movements. I'm really interested in understanding how this comes to be and how such deep anti-imperial networks and politics were flattened out into um, national histories and, and, and uh, with claims that uh, intellectuals were concerned only with nationalistic politics, particularly women um, intellectuals. This is, I think I'll stop there and I'd be really happy to be in conversation with all of you. Thank you. Um, that's completely fascinating. And I think that last question is one I think that um, potentially lots of people will be interested in, in, in discussing uh, l later on. So. Um, Fantastic, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so se our second paper, uh, Shanjana Chowdhury from Texas Christian University, um, Prostitutus Holy Warrior in, eight, in the um, 1857 up Uprising, recreating, I think I've, 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 I've written the, your title down incorrectly, uh, recreating women's identity through political resistance. And correct the title, uh, please. Um, I think you read it out correctly, Professor Wilson. Um, I must confess before starting that I really do not work with popular theater, but in this case, I just got sucked into the black hole of applying post-colonial theory to street plays. So there it goes, I'll start. In the 19th century, several traditional Indian customs that involved systematic gender oppression met with legislative intervention from the East India Company government and later from the colonial state these legal measures like abolition of sati, legalization of widow remarriage, and raising the age of consent were synchronous with the rise of educated middle-class women who actively participated in the national politics of colonial India. Partha Chatterjee's essay, Nationalist Resolution of the Women's Question, claims that women of lower socioeconomic classes were barred from this elite political sphere and were all but invisible in the political discourse of the time. Contrary to that belief, this paper argues that literary representations of marginalized women taking part in 1857 uprising indicates their presence in nationalist politics. In male-dominated anti-colonial nationalism, India has always been imagined as a passive woman, a helpless mother, who depends on her sons to free her. But popular plays about 1857 uprising, such as Utpaldad's Mohavid Draho, The Great Rebellion, and Tripurari Sharma's uh, Tale from the Year 1857, Azizun Nisa, question that representation by foregrounding women's political agency and identity outside of the prescribed maternal role. Reading through feminist and post-colonial theoretical lens, this paper will explore how the trope of prostitute as holy warrior challenges nationalist assumptions about women's role in political resistance. According to Chatterjee, the politically involved new woman was a contrast to three major categories of women. One, the common woman of the lower social class. Two, the previous generation of women who had been denied freedom. And three, the Western woman who lacked spiritual refinement. The nationalist movement bestowed on the new woman a new social responsibility of cultivating traditional spiritual qualities and thereby equating nationalist female emancipation with the historical goal of sovereign nationhood. However, Marxist feminist critic Himani Banerjee argues that this resolution of the women's question in nationalist discourse is monolithic and incomplete because it considers the male Hindu revivalist elite as the political agent of authentic decolonization. Therefore, the resolution only takes into account colonial mode of power and its anti-colonial nationalist response and cannot accommodate a critique of gender or class. So we must ask, what if the politically involved woman belongs to the lower social orders, but cultivates spiritual qualities of self-sacrifice, benevolence, devotion, religiosity, which are celebrated by the patriarchal nationalism? The new woman is idolized as goddess and as mother, but what if she's a prostitute? Her femininity is not supposed to be threatened by venturing outside the home, which is the inner social spiritual space, but what if her femininity itself becomes threatening? 
What if the independent nation state, along with all its post-colonial theories, conveniently forgets and thus tries to erase the complex identities of the politically resistant woman? Popular plays from People's Theatre is a possible answer to this erasure, I think. Utpal Dutt's The Great Rebellion and Sriparari Sharma's A Tale from the Year 1857, in their depiction of the prostitute as holy warrior in the 1857 uprising, are modes of remembrance and acts of resistance. Postcolonial theorist Leela Gandhi has argued that postcolonialism is a theoretical resistance to the anti-colonial and independent nation states desire to forget the colonial past and urge to self-invent. She asserts that revisiting, remembering, and interrogating the colonial past must be essential part of the decolonizing project. In his play, The Great Rebellion, Utpal Dutt successfully engages in this decolonizing project by remembering the political participation and personal agency of women from lower socioeconomic orders. The central female character of the play, Waziran, is a prostitute who serves the British officers in a sepoy camp, but chooses to have a romantic relationship with one of the sepoys, Lachman. Later on during the mutiny, the other sepoys object to Waziran's presence, and they say Lachman is dragging his woman to the battlefield, but Waziran replies to them, what do you mean by woman? What do you mean by prostitute? I am a holy warrior. And when her lover Lachman proposes to marry her, she refuses because she does not want the constraints of a monogamous relationship. And active political participation allows Waziran to recreate her identity on her own terms, and I think she also serves as a reminder of women's role in nationalist wars when she argues with the sepoys, saying, you think this war is your personal affair? Peasants, weavers, fishermen, blacksmiths have joined the war along with their wives. Housewives are fighting in the streets of Lucknow, Kanpur, Gwalior, and Agra. The character of Waziran is therefore an act of resistance against the self-willed historical amnesia of nationalist post-colonial discourse that has attempted to erase women resistors who did not fit the bill of the elite educated middle-class new woman. Foregrounding the prostitute as an integral part of the uprising also challenges the anti-colonial nationalist struggles investment in the binary of martial man versus chest woman. The male body is viewed as ready to die and kill for the nation, whereas the female body is considered to be chest, symbolizing national honor, as well as the moral code for all women. Political scientist Srikota Banerjee states that a gender tension arises when women enter a movement to fight for the liberation of an oppressed group and unexpectedly find themselves struggling with the ideals of muscular nationalism, usually centered in some notion of normative femininity constructed by the expectation that proper woman, chest, modest, virtuous, should remain aloof from the tainting influence of public politics, specifically political violence, the prostitute as holy warrior does not belong to the category of chest, modest, virtuous woman, and she becomes doubly subversive when she engages in political violence. This complicated figure is further problematized in Sherman's play, A Tale from the Year 1857, as its protagonist, Azizun Nisa, is a courtesan, not a prostitute. Historically, courtesans were influential elite artists at all Hindu and Muslim courts in pre-colonial Indian kingdoms. And it was the British government that ignorantly equated the courtesan's quota, which is her home, which also served as her metfil, the center for cultural entertainment with brothels. And the concept was later perpetuated by the middle-class Indian nationalists. The middle-class respectability politics of the nationalist discourse ensured that the new woman always belonged to the educated middle class. But the social class of a courtesan is not so easily designated. Azizun has her own home and her own source of income. She's a financially independent woman, which is much more than what can be said of the new woman. 
But she's also insulted by the British officers in the play who think she's a prostitute, an insult they probably would not have leveled at a new woman from a middle class family. The nationalist resolution of the women's question basically turns on two fundamental precepts. One, the new woman must seek cultural refinement and nurture spiritual qualities at home. And secondly, her venture into the outside world should not threaten her feminine virtues. And the character Azizun disrupts both of these. As a courtesan, she seeks cultural refinement, but this refinement is the foundation of her profession. The new woman is supposed to be educated and refined, yes, but those are for her personal development, not professional achievement. Azizun is spiritual. Her language and actions are replete with religious references throughout the play. But unlike a traditional wife and mother, she nurtures these spiritual qualities in her metfil. Since the metfil is where the home and the world meet, Azizun belongs to both. It seems that she meets the criteria of the new woman, but at once subverts them because she does not conform to the normative gender roles or the traditional family structure. She takes part in the 1857 uprising, helping the Sipoys, first as an informer and later as a holy warrior. Her feminine virtues are annihilated by this change of profession from courtesan to soldier. Since recreating her identity as a soldier, she can no longer remember what she used to do in the play. She forgets the lyrics of the songs she wrote and the intricate dances that she had painstakingly learned and skillfully performed over the years. And by the end of the play, she puts to death the British women and children who were given shelter by one of the leaders of the rebellion. And she even rationalizes her decision to kill the white women and children. She says it was a right of war. It was her right to perform. And this transformation of Azizun from the charming courtesan to the ruthless warrior is clearly a contrast to the idolization of woman as mother and goddess to which the patriarchal nationalist politics subscribes. The nation as mother is the feminine ideal and the chest modest virtuous woman as wife and mother is its corporeal representation. Therefore, the nationalist politics prescribes mandatory wifehood and motherhood as the only roles possible for a woman, while reserving for men the martial duty of protecting and defending the nation and women. Azizun is a courtesan, and she must be entirely dedicated to her art. She cannot marry or have children. And since she cannot represent the feminine ideal, the nationalist discourse refuses to acknowledge her. Moreover, by engaging in political violence, she encroaches on the sacred male duty of protection and defense of the feminine nation. And then she even desecrates that duty by killing women and children. She becomes a terrifying, threatening figure who cannot be accommodated within the nationalist discourse Though Azizun Nisa was a historical figure, she was involved in the siege of Kanpur, and her role in the Bibikar massacre is not really known clearly, but she has been erased by the later cultural uh, nationalist project, either because Kanpur was not one of the finest nationalist moments, or because Azizun could not be integrated into the goddess mother category, or both. Women from lower social classes were an integral part of the local resistances that disrupted colonial rule throughout the empire. But since she did not represent the feminine ideal, um, these women became dissenters history and not the nationalist version of it that was later perpetuated. People's theater is a powerful tool of reclaiming dissenters history and such other histories of marginalized people who are usually erased by cultural nationalist project and the prostitute as a holy warrior is one of many such marginalized categories. Using people's theater as a mode of cultural activism and resistance against dominant patriarchal nationalist discourse, playwrights Utpal Dutt and Chipurari Sharma 
write the prostitute and courtesan back into the history of the nation. And I'm done. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Lots of uh, food for thought and uh, questions that the issues that um, will elicit questions in, in a few moments, I'm sure. Um, so our third uh, paper is from Madeleine Lefouz from uh, City University of New York, um, entitled The Deadly Upas Tree, an Anti-Slavery Symbol Growing in the Gardens of Empire. Hi, thank you for having me here. I'm very, very grateful to be on this panel with everybody today. Um, can everybody see what I'm sharing? Wonderful. All right, here we go. Hopefully the um, videos don't block uh, things they need, they can't block. Okay, here we go. I'm going to take you across quite a bit of time and quite a bit of, um, quite a breadth of geography. Um, but here we go. So the upas tree. Um, so in this image from an 1853 abolitionist tract, Two men swing their axes into the trunk of a tree labeled slavery. One shouts to the onlooking crowd, a few more blows and down it must come. This accursed upas tree has too long flourished on the earth. He pulls back his ax, labeled Uncle Tom's Cabin, to strike again. And though today um, the upas tree is an obscure reference, this tree um, was uh, famously a poison plant and a common symbol of slavery in British and American abolitionist literature between the late 18th and the 19th, mid 19th centuries. And in this essay, I'm going to track how this tree came to, the, to be there, um, how it exploded into abolitionism out of, I argue, a long global history of European imperialism. To examine how poison and slavery became interlocked in this symbol, the upas tree, is to examine how struggles against imperialism informed anti-slavery. A genealogy of anti-slavery thought emerges that stretches back in time um, further than the 18th century as it is uh, its typical starting place and originates beyond the Atlantic on the turbulent peripheries of European expansion in Indonesia. Long used there as a weapon of war, in abolitionist discourse, however, the upas tree encouraged ever more drastic and immediate action. Like this 1853 image reveals, if slavery was a upas tree, or could be thought that way, then a book like Uncle Tom's Cabin in turn becomes an ax swung with violent force. And if slavery was poison issuing forth from the accursed upas tree, then abolition could simply not wait. So, the upas tree first drew the attention of European empires when indigenous Indonesian leaders deployed its poison against them. The Portuguese arrived at one island sultanate, uh, Makassar, to trade for spices in the early 1500s, followed by the Dutch, Danish, French, and English over the course of century later. The Dutch then demanded exclusive trade rights, but Makassar leaders refused, including um, one of its chancellors named, um, I hope I don't mispronounce it, Karang Patingalong, uh, used the poison to bolster his authority in the face of these imperial pressures in the 1640s. So for instance, when an Englishman at one point killed a Makassar, uh, the Europeans on the island so feared that the locals would seek retribution that they asked the chancellor to make an example of the murderer. He obliged and he turned the execution in turn into a political uh, spectacle by inviting the Europeans to watch. He poisoned the tip of a blowgun arrow and asked a European into what part of the murderer's body he should fire that arrow. Now the big toe of the foot was a challenging mark, but his aim was true. The condemned man died instantaneously, convincing all that the Makassars controlled a super weapon. So then the Dutch East India Company, also known as the VOC, tried to wrest control of this super weapon after conquering Makassar in 1669. Here is a depiction of, that, um, of those battles. Commander Cornelis Spielman, who's in the upper corner there, um, introduced the upas tree poison um, to the drug trade, studied its use by his Indonesian allies, excellent dart men. Here are the dart men in action. Um, and encouraged others in the VOC to gather information on it. By the Dutch governor's own order, 
the Makassars were, and I quote, tortured, yeah, killed for specifics on the Yupas tree. These extreme measures testify to the violence of VOC rule and the high priority the Dutch placed on the poison. They furthermore indicate that the Makassars themselves considered the poison a valuable tool of resistance, for it was worth dying to protect it from the Dutch. In this, the Makassars were successful. One VOC naturalist admitted that, quote, their arts are unknown to us. But in their pursuit of fact, these VOC naturalists also disseminated fictions about the Yupas tree, which would then seize a hold of the European imaginations. So one naturalist claimed that, quote, everything that its wind touches uh, perishes. Here, um, the naturalist was probably misapplying local lore about the black pepper, which held that nearby vegetation, quote, will not grow well because the vapors of the pepper are hot. Um, another naturalist reported that the tree was so venomous that those who are condemned to die um, fetch the poison, but not one in a hundred escapes death. And you can see that this particular story or image really caught a hold of um, not just the British, not just the Dutch, um, but the French as well. Um, here is a criminal going to collect it. Um, here is the result. You can see many have died on the way. Um, so by the late 18th century, these exaggerated accounts of the tree had spread uh, to Britain, to France, um, and catapulted to fame there. So let's look at Britain. Um, so the British uh, romantic poets uh, took these Dutch accounts of the Upas tree and spun them into an international morality tale about the conjoined evils of imperialism and slavery. Um, they did so inspired by the wider culture of political radicalism in Britain and catalyzed by the East India Company's colonization of Java, brief colonization, in 1811. Um, and they led wide audiences, these poets did, um, to evaluate their empire's contradictory relationship with uh, slavery using the Upas. So context, as historian David Brian Davis has pointed out, when Britain colonized Java, it monopolized the global tropical produce market, an advantage it then guarded with an international campaign against the slave trade. Britain reached new heights of moral righteousness with this campaign. And yet, the, by the British governor of Java's own estimate, there were no less than 27,142 enslaved people on the island in 1814. So slavery in Java is disrupting the British empire's humanitarian self-image. And in this political context, the Upas tree became, to quote Lord Byron, um, sorry, that's blocked a bit, the all blasting tree, raining down disease, death, and bondage. Um, so the romantic poets, such as Byron, um, in turn influenced Robert Wedderburn, an abolitionist often identified as one of the movement's most radical. Wedderburn was born to an enslaved woman in Jamaica around 1762, um, and Wedderburn's father, an enslaver, manumitted him at an early age. He became a fixture in London's political landscape, and he, he um, pushed contemporary thinkers to take more extreme positions, and he drew inspiration from them um, himself. So in his 1817 addresses to the enslaved people of um, Jamaica, we can see that Wedderburn is borrowing a bit from Shelley. So, and they read the same thing. So it's totally believable. So um, Wedderburn, for instance, is borrowing Shelley's line from Queen Mab um, to title Wedderburn's own um, addresses to the enslaved people. The addresses are named the ax laid to the root or a fatal blow to oppressors. And indeed we see ax laid to the root here. Um, so Shelley's imagery leaves little doubt he was referring to the upas tree. Um, if you see venomed exhalations, for instance, poison tree. Um, and this line has its own echo in a biblical allusion here, which was much used at the time. Um, yes, so for instance, Thomas Spence was laying axes to roots in 1801 and 1814. And Thomas Paine before him in, the seven, in his 1794, The Age of Reason. So this biblical warning to repent before death um, is in fact amplifying um, the message romantic poets had instilled in the upas tree, i.e. 
slavery poisoned empire. Yet only Wedderburn went so far as to actually reach out to enslaved people and stir up rebellion on the scale of the Haitian revolution. So in his addresses, he's issuing dramatic warnings to quote, the planters for the fate of Saint Domingo awaits you. And he proudly is holding up his own maroon ancestors as a standard as he urged enslaved men and women to quote, learn the art of war to repel those men who are now scheming in Europe against the blacks of Saint Domingo and against Jamaican rebels too. So Wedderburn had named his addresses in the sincere belief that many a quote, fatal blow um, was needed to end enslavement and British colonization together. Uh, Wedderburn used the logic of the upas tree to structure his argument for violent immediatism, immediate abolition, demonstrating how an Indonesian weapon grew into a powerful symbol of radical abolitionism. And now the upas tree, having already crossed some oceans, is going to cross another one and proliferate in American abolitionism. So in a period where President Thomas Jefferson was rapidly expanding the United States territory, and with that territory, slavery, the upas tree spread just as quickly, but through the Northern stronghold of Jefferson's political opponents. So by 1800, a New York newspaper could declare, everyone has heard of the poison tree of Java. This fame is due in part to the widespread printing of those romantic poet stanzas on the upas tree in Northern newspapers. And of course the upas tree's um, popularity is also bolstered by its convenient foil in American culture, which is the Liberty tree. So for instance, um, you see that um, one paper starts accusing Jefferson's party of, and I quote, uh, throwing, br throwing brambles from the upas tree of aristocracy into the garden from whence flourishes the tree of Liberty. So the strength of this symbolic contrast helps account for why newspaper men, despite debunking the tree's legendary poison in print over and over and over again, they could not seem to convince themselves or others that it was harmless. And indeed, a much reprinted melange of various Dutch naturalist accounts kept alive the fear of, quote, the king of Makassar's poison by declaring that this tree may be called the emperor's great military magazine. And so for them, no matter if the tree's toxicity was scientifically speaking, a wild exaggeration, politically, it was still a potent weapon. And now by contrast to these uh, Northern newspapers, um, both the implicit critique of slavery and the relative paucity of print culture uh, stunted the upas tree's growth in the South, the slave owning South. So in 1810, a Charleston, South Carolina newspaper tried even to invoke the upas tree in, in some writing, but it couldn't do it without interrupting that account with a huge footnote at the end trying to explain what it was. And then meanwhile, 4th of July, same year, you look at teeny tiny Hallowell, Maine, much smaller in population, way off the beaten track. And what are they doing? They're raising their glasses and they're cheering these words, independence. Jefferson's upas tree has injured its growth, but our glory has not departed forever. So as immediate abolitionism became more mainstream in the United States during the 1850s, it leveraged the by now well understood argument of slavery's dangerous poison that had been over the years condensed into the symbol of the upas tree. So for instance, um, the famous abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison, himself, um, could publish an article entitled A Bloody Record, Leaves from the Southern Upas, and trust readers to perform an analysis of the violence against slaves that he listed there, with just that one mention of the Upas tree in the title, nothing else. And Garrison goes on, later he's imagining reducing the tree, the Upas tree, to firewood. Um, here. Um, in a similar article, entitled um, A Basket of Chips from the Upas Tree of Slavery. He's presenting more episodes of violence against slaves alongside this wish here that um, these episodes kindle or these accounts kindle a fire in your soul that will enable you to labor with mind, heart and hands for the eradication of the deadly Upas Tree of Slavery. Uh, he emphasized that through the destruction um, that um, though the destruction uh, that 
the destruction of slavery could indeed um, threaten violence, but that violence will in the end be for the best, as he says here. So to wrap up, we find uh, that the formerly enslaved woman, millionaire, and radical abolitionist Mary Ellen Pleasant invested her hopes for just such a violent and immediate conclusion to slavery in John Brown. So a note on Brown's person after his um, 1859 attempt to incite an enslaved rebellion at Harper's Ferry in Virginia. Um, there's a note there that reverberates with Wedderburn's uh, biblical allusions. So here's the note. Um, yes. Uh, and in this note uh, that Pleasant wrote, it promises that the ax is laid at the foot of the tree. When the first blow is struck, there will be more money to help. So in this note, Pleasant is recognizing that Brown's revolt was a first blow to slavery, and she promises additional financial assistance. The upas tree had made the relevance of tree and slavery ax blow and enslaved rebellion, obvious to her. And so now at the eve of the American Civil War, the upas tree had operated over centuries of armed struggle against imperialism and slavery as both a weapon and a war cry. And it's this deep history that encouraged British and American abolitionists like Pleasant to use any means necessary, even civil war, to chop down the upas tree of slavery. Thank you. Great. Um, many thanks. Um, and our final um, paper before we open things up for discussion uh, by Manishini Sen from the University of Hyderabad, um, tracing an alternative narrative of anti-colonialism, um, intellectual history and trade union leadership in late colonial Bengal between 1920 and 1950. So. Okay. Hello, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you all. Uh, so I'll start. The omnipresence of the theme of nationalism in the enterprises addressing the intellectual history of decolonization in South Asia often obliterates disparate innovations and reflections on the period. The existing gamut of literature on trade unionism in 20th century Bengal centered on the performative aspects of the political activism of the leadership class often eclipses their auxiliary faculties. The wave of socialism triggered a veritable current of cultural defiance, which fetched Bengal its very own faction of intellectuals with a dishonorable leftist orientation. However, the intellectual ventures of the trade unionists become peripheral to these inquiries or a mere tool to further scrutinize their political praxis. It is pertinent to delve into the plethora of literature entailing political essays, organizational manifestos, personal memoirs, and correspondences of these leaders, since they have a distinct characteristics emanating from their endeavor to bridge the gap between political practice and ideology. Targeted at an audience hailing specifically from the margins, this literature, overtly in vernaculars, here, especially in Bengali, was an intervention in mapping truly local receptions and adaptations of socialism. The primary aim is to interrogate this void in the historiography, to create a more inclusive intellectual history, tracing narratives of anti-colonialism, which gets relegated to the fringes of mainstream deliberations. From 1920s onwards, Bengal saw advent of a new brand of leadership in working class politics. While decoding their intent of writing, it is important to put in context the aforesaid period between 1920 to 47, or what veritably triggered a change in their cognitive landscape and determined their intellectual output. From the end of 19th century, there were nascent twists with the ideas of socialism. From 1874, Bharat Somojivi, a monthly paper was produced by Brahmo leader Shoshipada Bondovadha, which was singing praises of the revolutionary ideals of, of Paris Commune. But it was not before Russia went through a revolutionary upheaval in 1917 that a serious discourse was initiated among various factions of Bengali intellectuals on the new creed of communism. In the aftermath of the First World War, the invincibility and charm of liberal democracy started waning off, and the rise of communism as an alternative economic order was gaining ground in Europe and the Americas. These currents were transmitted from the metropole to the colonies too, 
Emigre the Bengalis like Virendranath Chattopadhyay, Abhinav Mukherjee, and M. N. Roy were trying to harness international assistance to deliver India from the yoke of colonialism. It triggered the onset of networks and exchanges which seldom confined itself to the realms of merely forging political solidarity to counter the scourges of imperialism. There was steady inflow of socialist books, journals, and also onset of correspondences from various communist organizations around the globe, like the Communist Party of Great Britain, the other leftist parties from France and even in Canada. Books like Lenin's Left-Wing Communism or Gabriel Deville's The People's Marx formed the curriculum. This was coupled with general disillusionment about Gandhian mass politics and the Indian National Congress, which was essentially a bastion of upper caste Hindus and their politics laced with strong overtures of Hindu revivalism, invariably initiated among them a quest for an alternative. The adherents of this new gospel of socialism entailed a distinct social class of urban intellectuals who held often from the lower middle classes and at times from the rank of the proletariat themselves. This essential organic character of the movement transformed the very nature of the late colonial middle class labor leadership and the intellectual enterprise spearheaded by them as an essential departure from the traditional canonical view of nationalism. Roy played a decisive role in their quest for an alternative path to decolonization, as he stimulated the formation of the Workers and the Peasants Party in Bengal in 1925, which acted as the granite block in the organization of the workers on socialist lines. And these individuals, like Muzaffar Ahmed, Shomendunath Tagore, Abdul Halim, assumed paramount roles as the new vanguards. The mouthpieces of these organizations, initially Langol or Plow and Gonobani from 1926, became their avenues to voice their opinions. These union leaders were initiating a new form of discourse in the analysis of the oppressive mechanism of co colonialism, imperialism, and fascism, anchored in communism and Marxist Leninism. In a landmark essay from 1926 titled Amra Kano Noi, Why Are We Not Free? Ahmed was outlining the impediments behind an organized mass movement from below. He was stressing how capitalism as a system was aiding the reproduction of the oppressive structure of colonialism. The English bourgeois class, which was the driving force of its imperialist ambitions, stimulated the genesis of an indigenous counterpart. He was castigating this comprador class, and I quote, they might not know the location of the property, but they own it all. Without even touching a commodity, they are the biggest stakeholders. They are not even the manufacturers of any good, but they own it all. And finally, when it comes to the service sector, the lesser they work, the higher their pay gets. This contrastrating sarcasm and opprobrium of the colonial capitalists are grafted in the Marxist theory of alienation. This essay is also an implicit critique of the Gandhian ethos of spiritualism, ahimsa, or nonviolence. The trope of self-sacrifice was banal among the Gandhian trade unionists who posed it as the only way for the amelioration of the masses. The newer generation of the leftist leaders saw in it clear intention of hindering working class radicalization at grassroots level to benefit the national bourgeois. Also coming under sharp criticism was political action elicited from unfettered patriotism. The term Ugro Jatiyotabad or ultranationalism was frequent in writings of unionists like Shomendunath Tagore, who used it for criticizing the political programs of the Congress and the Swarajas. The interwar period witnessed how imperialism and capitalism nurtured in itself the rabid trend of fascism. His brief sojourn in Germany during the turbulent decades of 20s and early 30s, his association with anti-colonial writers like Anze Geet, and his ardent admiration for Ari Barbis, French pacifist and communist, made him pen down to nuanced critiques of imperialism impregnated with fascism. Fascism, produced in 1934, was a critique of authoritarian Italian state under Benito Mussolini, the other monologue, Hitlerism, or the Aryan rule in Germany, entails his insights on Nazism and racial apartheid, which was published serially in uh, Gono Shokri from 1933. In these texts, he was delineating the possible upsurge of this vicious trend within the ranks of the anti-colonial struggle in Bengal, referring to professors from Calcutta University like Pramotho uh, Roy and Shuniti Kumar Chattopadhyay and their efforts at translating the speeches of Mussolini and eulogizing him, he was unveiling the reactionary nature of the nationalist bourgeois. 
Other recurring themes in their writings revolved around the material condition of the working class and how to organize them into unions to ensure militant activism to counter capitalist oppression. A significant essay in this regard was penned down by Shantoshi Kumari Devi. Uh, it was titled Bang, uh, Bangla Chotkwale Kotha or a word about Bengal's jute mills. This two-part essay in 1923 elaborated the grievances of the workers around increase in working hours and heavy casualization post the First World War. It was a robust criticism of socio-political and economic drain of the colony contingent on empirical data and astute logic, which at places was even sharper than her male counterparts. There was proliferation of several socialist weeklies and journals from 1930s like Shorbohara, Proletariat, Dean Mojo or the Daily Wager, and Marx Badi or the Marxist, apart from John Ojudhu or People's War, which was a weekly of the Communist Party of India from 1941. Prominent communist trade unionists like Ronan Shen, Shomnat Lahiri, and Shoroj Mukherjee were producing pieces in them, which often dealt with the most basic aspect of labor organization and impediments they faced in the field. Mukherjee's essay, Union Janish Taki, or What is Union, published in Ogroni in 1939, elucidated the functions of trade unions and significance of collective action in working class struggle. There was an ardent effort to expound in simplified and in most lay manner theoretical concepts like Sreni Vidhesh or class struggle in an endeavor to educate the workers and organize them on these lines. Particularly regretting is the use of the first person we in many essays, despite the fact that many of these leaders did not belong to the ranks of the laboring class. Not only was it a sincere attempt at making this text more relative for the workers and instilling them a sense of collectiveness, it also aimed at bridging the gap between the middle class leadership and the workers in general, which was diligently maintained by the humanitarian or the nationalist labor organizers in the past decades. These leaders were also charting the contentious terrain of mitigating the gap between political activism and thought. Unlike conventional theorists, their proximity to organizing the laborers on the ground often made them make compromises as they realized sticking to ideology might not always be optimal. These habitual dilemmas can often be sensed in their writings, especially when they address the question of communalism. But these leaders were not merely romanticizing communal harmony with the adage of Hindu-Muslim bhai bhai, but were probing the root of the problem. Their writings like Ahmed's Kothai Pratikar or Where is the Redressal, which was published in Langol around January 1926 were the scathing criticism of the Lucknow Pact signed between the INC and uh, Muslim League around 1916 and how mainstream political parties resorting to communal compromises will only jeopardize the decolonization effort. The abject poverty and lack of education were at the root of religion driven superstition among the laborers, which was to them a major impediment towards germination of secular sensibilities. Similar, uh, simultaneously, they were pragmatic enough to comprehend that the desires of ordinary masses can most conveniently be expressed in religious terms. So it was not unusual for them to organize religious festivals from Eid to Vishwakarma Puja in working class ghettos, which facilitated their mobilization drives. But for them, after all, communalism, in paper at least, was a manifestation of material contradiction, an apparatus of class oppression and aspiration, rather than being a cause in itself. The fiddled with the idea of reconciliation of religious identity with socialist consciousness. In an article titled Shadinata Shangra Me Mushulman O Bharate Radosho, the ideal of Muslims in struggle for freedom in India. In 1926, Abdul Halim highlights the attitude of Tatar Muslim of Russia post the revolution whereby they perceived pan-Islamism synonymous with socialism. However, he reverts back to Hindu-Muslim unity in India as the sole path of the, communist, uh, of the community's redemption. A particular lacuna is discernible in their intellectual production pertaining to caste oppression. However, this should never translate into any habitual remissness towards caste-based violence within the movement. As we know, the first strike of the scavengers working under the Calcutta Corporation took place in 1928 and the leadership of early communists like Dharani Goswami, Muzaffar Ahmed, and Dr. Prabhavati Dash Gupta. Shomendranat, in his autobiography, Jatri, or The Voyager, lambasted Gandhi's adherence to Varnasham as allegiance to an outdated and unscientific norm perpetuating structural societal inequality for decades. So to conclude, it is perceptible that the intellectual ventures of these working class leaders were inclined to the wider process of social transformation during the late colonial era. 
The Second World War further radicalized their literature and their direct exposure to the plight of the workers rendered a different characteristics to their writings. Not only did they enunciate questions that were drowning in larger currents of mainstream decolonization movement dominated by the rhetoric of bourgeois nationalism, but it also bolstered the voices and uh, aspirations from the margins aiding in the reclamation of their agency. Their reception of a global ideology and their efforts to mitigate multiple and often contrasting socio-cultural identities surrounding it is an archetype of internationalism from below. Their correspondences and memoirs often mirrors this eternal struggle to come in terms with the dialectical interplay between individual radicalization and wider established social norms. For instance, Shomendona Tagore was the first in the family, Tagore family to join politics directly and often found himself at odds with Rabindranath Tagore, who was a towering presence in his life due to his adherence to communism. But the most significant and enduring of their contributions would undoubtedly be the creation of an alternative vision of anti-colonialism, which augmented accommodation of marginal political sensibilities within a broader framework of a new emergent egalitarian, or, egalitarian world order, and in a sense, indeed led to the recovery of globalism within a history of eternal localism. Thank you. Fantastic, um, wonderful, thank you so much. Um, um, I'm just going to hand over to Gautam for some comments to kick off the discussion and then we can, um, you know, kind of respond to questions coming from, um, I don't quite know how to describe, participants, audience, uh, people um, who are part of the seminar. So, but I, but I, um, I'm going to ask people to start um, asking questions in the Q&A um, section now um, while Gautam um, sort of uh, comments, um, if, if, if that makes sense. So, so, so don't, don't hold back, um, uh, but uh, over to you, Gautam. Thank you so much, Professor Wilson. Um, uh, first of all, wow, thanks to all of you for your scintillating presentations. And please do excuse me if, I'm, if my comments might sound dilettante or amateurish, because I'm not that familiar with all the fields represented um, in your papers, but uh, uh, having read your essays basically in the last couple of days and then listening to your presentations, I am actually quite struck by the parallels between your work and the sort of uh, critical, uh, both literary critical, cultural critical, and historiographical currents that play through your work. Um, some of these, of course, are, if I might broadly generalize, the, the interplay between uh, metropolitan notions of intellectual hierarchies and conceptual hierarchies. What does a tree mean? What does a tree stand for? What does a performance stand for? What does an individual act of rebellion stand for? As I believe in Madeleine's and Sanjana's cases, what does an individual act of organizing labor stand for? As in uh, Manashwini's, I'm, I hope using first names is okay if you don't mind for. So Manaswini's presentation and also, in, uh, and then Shruti tries to see some of these uh, interplays in her piece, which I believe from the way uh, it was written is a chapter in your dissertation, right? That's what you, yeah, yeah. So what I'm interested in therefore is in your papers, there seems to be a template for doing intellectual history or global history, global conceptual history that speaks with each, that speaks between the metropole and the periphery, although of course the center and the periphery binary is itself much, uh, you know, it has been stretched out and repeated ad infinitum and that of course needs revisiting, but this interplay and this encounter remains at the heart of your papers. The other thing that was very interesting to see is that many of you have revisited, especially the papers which deal with um, uh, female characters in history or literature. For example, Sanjana, I believe, uh, talked about Azizu Nissa, by the way, a play which I like very much, and a character which is uh, not focused upon that well in Indian historiography, uh, which talks of a, of a female actor in the freedom struggle. Uh, although it predates figures like Matangini Hajra and even Prithivada Vadyadar, who uh, acted in the dance struggle against um, uh, against uh, the British, the famous Chittagong armory um, raid case. Uh, 
Many of the leading figures of the Indian independence struggle, the women, many of the fem leading female figures were keenly conscious of a feminine co-presence in agitational union-based, uh, ex call it extremist rebellious uh, activities. So both in armed struggle, in, in Congress or communist organization of labor and different social classes, in terms of transcending caste, class, and gender stereotypes. In all these cases, the surprising fact that comes into my mind is that, uh, and many of you have pointed this out, is that women of certain classes or castes or social uh, origins easily transcend these boundaries when it comes to the broader goal. I'd like to quote, if I may, uh, if I may John, do I have a couple of more minutes? Oh, yeah, go for it. So if I may quote from, this is a piece from, uh, I believe, Vineet Thakur. So I'm, I must, uh, I'm quoting from Vineet Thakur's essay on the Asian Relations Conference 1947, which was theoretically organized by Nehru, but actually he sort of, um, he sort of dovetailed most of the organizational work to his uh, sister, I believe. So mm -hmm. uh, the Asian Relations Conference in 1947 and the other in important international conference which predate, which, which comes before the famous Bandung Conference of 1955 by just a week. So 6th to 14th was the conference in New Delhi and then the next week everyone goes on to Bandung. So people just come to Delhi and then they move on to Bandung. The Bandung Conference has naturally received a lot of intellectual and academic focus, but the Delhi Conference hasn't. The interesting thing about the Delhi Conference is it was led by actually a woman. So the organizational work and everything was done by a woman. So what I would just like to quote on one um, Sarojini Naidu who spoke, uh, Sarojini Naidu's speech at the Asian Relations Conference, and then I will end by referring to Madeleine's paper, because there are certain, as, a, as someone who comes from literary cultural history, so it's her paper, uh, I thought, deserves just taking apart a little bit and commenting upon separately. So the quote from Sarojini Naidu, which comes from her speech at the Asian Relations Conference in 1947 and the 2nd of April, ends with the following lines, fellow Asians, as I called you the other day, my comrades, my kinsmen, arise. Remember the night of darkness is over. Together, men and women, let us march forward to the dawn. So in figures like Sarojini Naidu, Hannah Sen, who worked closely with Gandhi, we see a very keen understanding and a very clear understanding that this women were co-equal, were to have co-equal partnerships with um, the nationalist enterprise. Now going to Madeline's paper, which uh, taught me a great deal about this particular episode. And I find that this is a very interesting a way, I, I don't know if you've looked at it madly, because I am more and more excited. Uh, I'm reading, of late, I'm reading a lot of global microhistory, the Cambridge group, which does global microhistory, the Warwick group, which does global microhistory, and the famous historian sitting in Iceland who does <laughs> microhistory. So I was wondering, the way you locate, the way you take the history of this Yupas tree, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and you trace it back to um, the Dutch response to this tree or the Dutch exaggeration, as you, I believe, mentioned, the exaggeration of the toxicity of this tree. And then how you look at the conflation of Dutch and British approaches to and self-justification of empire. So there is a self-justification of empire happening of the civilizational project of empire and of the you know, of the top-down project of empire, and it is being related to an exoticization of the danger represented by tropical vegetation, tropical bodies, tropical practices. So I find this very interesting because, and I was wondering if you would like to, uh, do you see global microhistorical uh, possibilities in your project? So without much more ado, I'd to sort of uh, return, the, give the floor back to John. Thank you. Um, thank you, yes. Uh, Wonderful. Um, I um, do. We have any questions? No, we have no questions um, from from anyone else. But um, I um, 
wondered specifically whether it made sense to kind of ask Madeline to respond uh, to the kind of uh, provocation from Gautam there. Um, and then I had a couple of questions that I was going to ask to other panel, panel members and um, and uh, we and, and hopefully we'll have sort of a bit more of a discussion flowing um, by, by then. But um, Madeline, do you want to specifically and, and, and then maybe other panelists kind of specifically um, specifically kind of engage with the question of kind of global micro histories, which I think is a really interesting theme, actually not potentially within only your paper, but other papers here too, but, but Madeline to begin with. Thank you for bringing that to my attention, the idea of global micro histories. To be honest, I hadn't, I hadn't considered it yet. Um, and that's just due to my own ignorance really. Um, but I, I appreciate that because Honestly, this is like a topic that's given me quite a bit of trouble in how to organize it and what belongs and what's left out. For instance, um, you kind of hit on something at the in your comment about like the dangers, right? The the dangers to like the the civilizing um, project of empire um, that uh, Java, for instance, uh, threatens, right? And there's something to that that I that there's this big area that I can can't hardly um, touch all the time, right? Of um, like there's there's definitely some allusions to Eden, and the the snake in the tree, and um, knowledge and poisonous knowledge, and so there's all these elements that I can't easily find ways always to fit in, and so I've had to make some choices um, in the longer version of this paper in the longer, um, yeah, um, but perhaps that's one way of doing it that I hadn't um, that I hadn't thought of. Maybe that's a, a good um, way of thinking about it um, to make it a bigger, um, a bigger project, but thank you. Um, I'd also like to say though, that I really um, enjoyed your, your uh, initial point um, as well about uh, concepts of metropole and, per and periphery, because that is something, and when you, because uh, uh, that's something that uh, is obviously germane to, to this um, bit of research I'm doing too. But I also think it's interesting when things skip over imperial boundaries, right? And why they skip over one empire into another empire and what facilitates that. Like for instance, I don't really include it in my work, but uh, here that you saw here, but there's some Dutch British competition over upis tree research and they start to steal um, from one another. And there's some Brit there's some, uh, the British Royal Society tries to contact a Dutch agent that has some links to Britain and be like, hey, you wanna tell us about that poison? Um, so there's like, there's inter-imperial rivalries at play here too that are just absolutely fascinating and really also expand um, the story as well. Yeah, so thank you. Good, um, did, did the other panelists want, want to come in on that point around, I guess the kind of metropole, um, quote unquote periphery, you know, kind of skipping over boundaries, et cetera. Cause I think they're, I mean, yeah, some, some, a good, good way to frame the discussion here. I don't know if other, others want to come in. Anyone? Um, yeah, I don't mind actually. Should he, yeah. So, yeah, uh, thanks so much, Gautam. That was um, interesting. And of course it's, um, I mean, I could see the threads as well. And um, I guess I wonder, um, what happens to kind of uh, the kinds of women I'm looking at as um, intellectual actors who haven't been looked at um, in that sense before. And you're absolutely right. They were so pivotal to organizing such incredibly um, rich, but also politically charged uh, movements and activism and resistance. So really the question is less of um, was this happening at all, but rather why this has been erased, right? Because obviously when you go back and read these memoirs in my House is now filled with <laughs> so many of these um, um, materials. But um, the interesting thing is they 100% were sure of kind of their place in all of this. And um, they thought of themselves as equal and, and co-producers of um, these ideas. But as you move along, somehow this erasure is so deliberate and so systemic that um, all traces of their um, existence has been wiped out as intellectual thinkers. So um, yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, I think that uh, the idea of um, whether global micro histories are possible is also an interesting one. I've been um, recently thinking about the ideas of um, global intellectual histories of um, women's thought historically. And it's really interesting because 
there exists this um, set of actors and networks of anti-colonial women who went to these conferences. Um, they had uh, their own Asian relations conference in 1937 in Lahore. Um, and these women came in and talked about kind of Asian visions of the international, which were quite problematic, but also quite productive in, in, in many ways. And, and um, somehow that never, uh, they never had a second conference. So it was kind of a one hit wonder thing, but it's again, very interesting to think about why that failed, what we can learn from that and um, think through cut, cutting across imperial histories of French, British, um, you know, um, Dutch and think about women who were resisting various forms of imperialism and um, how they were uh, strategically in conversation with one another. I, I mean, it's probably too big of a project, but then it's, it's probably many projects, but it's a very interesting idea to think about it, but thank you. Any other panelists want to come in on that, that point? Um, yeah, I would like to add to what Shruti said. I was mostly thinking about archives in the sense of textual archives, because most of the recorded thoughts of women are by women who have been educated within the traditional system and whose thoughts have been recorded in text and those have been preserved. But thinking in terms of oral histories or people belonging to particular social classes whose thoughts are not recorded and how do we bridge that gap? Um, and I don't know, honestly, maybe in certain cases, literature can take some liberties and create these sorts of characters to tell those stories where maybe um, archival history cannot. I really don't know, but I think it would be an interesting area to explore. It's already being done. For example, um, the series Mutiny at the Margins, edited by Crispin Bates, uh, particularly the volume about subaltern narratives, does explore this. So I'm just wondering how we can recover women's thoughts those which haven't really been recorded in text. Uh, well, uh, I, 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 I can uh, like, uh, it was the same problem, I think, for me also to add to this. And also while I was reading Shruti's paper, especially her conclusion, where she was saying like, uh, you know, all the time for women, we do not really get a separate sources probably. And activism can be seen as an extension to their political thoughts and how their activism translates or into their political thoughts. This is a very important problem. Uh, like this is a very uh, pertinent problem, I think, uh, which uh, like uh, I faced while I wanted to recover uh, the, uh, you know, like uh, the voices of female trade unionist leaders. Like I have cited one, but uh, there's hardly any written text uh, you found uh, by them. But what you find are interviews. Uh, there are interviews where they are, and there are also questions like whether these women are even registering uh, gender as, um, uh, veritable uh, access to which inequality uh, was a veritable access of inequality itself for their themselves becoming, uh, you know, like uh, victims of a uh, sort of uh, patria uh, uh, a sort of uh, dominance uh, in a field which was highly, highly mainly ma uh, man, um, uh, like uh, dominated by males. But, uh, but, the, uh, but given the fact that um, there was a huge rise of, uh, and it was like officially recognized in the uh, trade, uh, the official report on the working of the Trade Union Act in 1944, uh, like post-war, that there was a quadruple amount of number of uh, trade unionists, female trade unionists within, uh, 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 with, who were registered in the registered union itself. So you can understand like how many unregistered unions were there. So uh, like if we go through their uh, interviews uh, and memoirs, uh, we will see like uh, they were, they did had a cognizance of uh, the fact that uh, females are being, uh, uh, like they are being doubly exploited, not just, uh, it was both patriarchy and uh, ca capitalism, which was, uh, uh, you know, the, at the root of their exploitation. Uh, 
like uh, they were talking about opening night schools or educating the women. Even the manifestos were talking remotely about maternity leaves for uh, the female workers. So uh, this is probably how uh, we can you know, uh, fill the void where there's no formal writings on part of them. Uh, you know, for, so this was something I was thinking while I was going through. Uh, um, I, did, I had a, two, two questions kind of specifically. Um, one of them to you all, um, which builds on, um, builds on kind of comments that, that, that in the comments, and as, as I throw my pen, um, uh, comments that people have made already, but um, about really the kind of method of intellectual history and, and um, you know, kind of, I sort of get a bit depressed sometimes about the way in which um, we often don't I think realize the sort of radical potential of the kind of work that you're doing to revise not just the empirical um, the, the empirical story that we tell about kind of the history of ideas at particular moments, but method. Um, and you know, kind of it's as if sometimes in order to gain legitimacy within the academy, kind of, you know, sort of uh, you know, people working on on um, resistance and also people working in a global context kind of end up, you know, saying, you know, basically sort of simply um, uh, you know, kind of using the same kind of methodological tools or whatever that, um, I don't know, the history of Hobbes, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, might require. And, I, and I, I just, I don't think that's good enough. I think that we, you know, in a sense, um, you know, we really are quite, you know, in, in order to understand kind of intellectual history on a, on a global scale and the kind of work that you're doing, um, uh, and even if intellectual history is the right category, um, I think potentially there does need to be quite a radical reframing of the kind of method that, um, that, that, that we're using and I think that your papers do that um you know there's from from what they from their kind of from, from the way they argue um what they're arguing uh, but I wondered if you had any more sort of I guess sort of theoretical reflections I suppose about um you know kind of how you know how we should do what kind of method methodological approach etc um we, we should take to, to writing um global intellectual history and and whether or not you know the sort of precepts of you know the likes of Quentin Skinner or whoever you know kind of should be um should be jumped um and I wonder potentially if they should be um so the second comment and that, that's to one of you second comment to um uh um specifically I suppose around kind of um periodization as but any of you can answer if you if you want but I think it's particularly to Manuccini and um uh um and Shruti um that there's, there's, there's often a kind of discussion um it's there to some degree in both of your both of your papers about um, the sort of possibilities that exist in the first half of the 20th century, I think. Um, and then, you know, um, it's almost as if kind of 1947 happens and it and it's my 1947 is kind of a regressive moment, you know, kind of and and I'm pushing this to the absolute limit here. But you know, that um, you know, colonial the period of empire and colonialism is one of of possibility in, in the future, and the future suddenly ends in 1947 and you end up with um, you know, the the, the 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 nationalist Indian state, and you know, as kind of uh, you know, politically, that's quite that's an odd odd position to end up at. Um, you know, but it's the one you know, it's one that we all end up at to some degree. I think you know, kind of um, particularly in a sort of historiographical moment where nationalism is 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 not something that you know we we we're looking for kind of post national kind of frames for things and so forth. Um, but. Um, uh, but 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 I, but I just wondered wondered what your reflections were really around around uh, that process of um, you know kind of around around chronology um, kind of there in terms of um, the idea of of the sort of period before before the fifties I guess kind of as a moment of as a moment of possibility as a moment replete with all sorts of kind of sort of radical possibilities as a, as a moment when um, there's you know scope for um, you know, kind of women to occupy political spaces that otherwise they might not have done um, scope for, um, you know, kind of sort of radical uh, working class kind of figures to kind of try and shape the future and so forth. And, and, and I suppose to, um, to wonder whether or not, I mean, and I think there's a kind of really rich historiography that's emerging, you know, kind of, um, which, which you both refer to um, around kind of internationalism and and you know kind of the, the possibilities of this moment but um particularly kind of how how does one answer the question that should be posed really at the end there which is you know you know how, how do we deal with this sort of 
moment, moment of possibility in the kind of sort of in the 30s to then um you know seemingly everything gets closed down and you just get the nation state and uh, elite nationalism kind of ruling uh, in the in the in the late 40s my answer would be it's not as simple as that in the late 40s and the 50s actually things are more complicated beyond but you know uh but it'd be really, really interesting to hear your thoughts i've silenced everybody um, <laughs> sort of, um so the me method and periodization i don't know if um uh, anyone wants to have a go at those please but the others are uh, sort of thinking through that. Could I just quickly um, pitch in there, if that's okay, John? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, what you mentioned about this, the, the sort of bridging moment between the 40s and the 50s, the 50s and the decolonizing moment. I mean, we have, for example, the big African decolonization happens in the 50s with Nkrumah in Ghana, the Indian and other Asian decolonizations happen late 40s. Now what's happening is we're seeing these very co-equal relationships or almost at least apparently co-equal relationships between women and men throughout the, uh, the, the decolonizing world, India, Southeast Asia, large parts of Africa. And then suddenly with, uh, you know, with independence in the case of India and certain other places, partition and divisions and, uh, and the crystallizations of the non-colonial states which inherited the administrative and bureaucratic mechanisms from the imperial constellations, but yeah. imposed a certain nationalistic consensus on it. So what happens is that nationalistic interpretation of the colonial structure kind of pushes women into certain roles as I think uh, all the three of you, Sanjana, Manaswini, and Shruti, you're sort of hinting at this in your papers in various ways, whether it be labor organizers in Manaswini's case or a charismatic, rebellious figures, marginalized figures in Sanjana's case, literary figures, and in Shruti's uh, discussions of uh, conferences and the, the broader organization of women's movement. You see the, a, a thread running through, and I would like to sort of pick up on what John said and wonder if this is something broader. There's an interesting uh, character who was in Shantini Ketan in the early 1940s, a German Jewish person who was in exile in England in the early in the late 30s and then at the beginning of the the blitz the London blitz the bombing of London so he went to India he taught English in Shantiniket and Tagore got him to India guys Alex Aronson so in the 1940s he moves to um, Israel and he teaches English in University of Haifa so this person writes, Alex Aronson writes, a bit like Auerbach when he was living in Istanbul. So this sense of the 1940s, the mid 40s, being a sejura where a lot of the, the progressive and internationalist and co-equal possibilities of the late 30s and early 40s kind of merge and get solidified into sort of stagnant structures from the 1950s and 60s. And then in the case of India, we have the first plan was a lukewarm success or even a success. The second plan kind of bombs. And that sort of hits the caste, uh, various caste movements, various states reorganization movements, and the initial euphoria in the labor movements, in the trade union movements, and in, for example, the Telangana struggles where women were hugely active. Sorry, I'm taking a lot of your time, I'll just finish. So in, if, for example, in Telangana, you have these women who in Eastern Bengal and in other parts of the country, the women who are tortured brutally by the police. And we see how active and how fearless these women were. But all that kind of gets time-eyed when the structure's falling in place in the 50s. I'll end that, that was the point I wanted to make. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Shruti. Um, uh, well, uh, to pick up uh, from there, yes, like if we see, like only like if, if I'm talking about uh, what I was doing, like I was, while I was charting the contribution and what actually uh, was uh, uh, forming the uh, cognitive landscape of these labor or the trade union movements. Uh, like I, I skipped the 30s part, I did not put it much in context, but a big part will be the Great Depression, obviously. You have the Great Depression, then following it, you have the Spanish War, and in the middle, the rise of fascism. The rise of fascism was extremely important because not just uh, these, uh, there were, uh, these were just the labor 
uh, I am just talking about uh, the labor union, uh, the labor union leaders, but they were also, uh, some of them were also part of the bigger addas or intellectual circles, like uh, we see, like the Polish Adda group, which was actually consisting of uh, proper Marxist theoreticians like uh, David Prasha Chattopadhyay, or even, uh, you know, the rise of uh, the League Against Fascism uh, and War, or uh, even like uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the, the anti-fascist writers and the artist association, which was like, which had a lot of uh, active uh, communist party members uh, or activists. Some of them who are even remotely uh, organizing labels during 40s and 50s, like uh, Shubhash Mukhopadhyay, or you have Tarashankar Bandhubadhyay, Manik Bandhubadhyay, or people like Gopal Haldar who were producing a lot of intellectual, uh, you know, like uh, intellectual output as far as uh, the vicious trend of fascism is concerned, or materialistically uh, seeing uh, the rise of fascism and also how to counter it. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, like uh, if we see uh, the trade unionists uh, who were actually talking about uh, like proper theoretical perspectives, we probably don't get many uh, other than uh, Shomendunath Tagore, who, who later became a uh, Trotskyist and also uh, wrote some, uh, like he, he was against the ultra Stalinist line. And so he was ob obviously at that point of time due to the, to some extent, the conservativeness of uh, the Communist Party itself was uh, out uh, outcasted and uh, he wrote, uh, but his was one of the first criticism and it was probably the first criticism of fascism on a first critical writing of fascism in Bengali. Mm -hmm. And it was actually produced around 34 with uh, R.P. Dutt when uh, he produced fascism and uh, social, uh, the social and socialist revolution. So yes, uh, 30 saw a lot of currents and even 45, throughout the 45 with the war, uh, like uh, if we if uh, if we see like the fall of Berlin was widely if uh, widely uh, you know celebrated in Calcutta among the workers you know there were huge working class uh, you know like a, uh, working class rallies that have been taken out at that point of time and uh, uh, so it 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 makes you wonder like whether it's it is kind of an internationalism from below because. Uh, uh, like how much uh, did they uh, uh, can comprehend about the fall of Berlin, but uh, they remotely understood that it was something that uh, uh, needed to be, you know, like um, uh, it, 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 it is important for them uh, to pay homage to and uh, uh, and uh, and and it, it also probably says a bit about the growing uh, consciousness among the workers. Uh, so yes, like uh, uh, moreover, uh, with uh, with the coming of fifties, to be very fair, um, the structure, uh, administrative structure, uh, doesn't change like that. Okay, like if if you see at least for the labor, uh, if we go to the archival files, you know, uh, uh, there is a labor commissioner. Uh, it, it 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 more or less remains the same and. Uh, Though there are some uh, changes due to, uh, uh, obviously, because uh, India became independent, but uh, the same structures were, uh, the structures were similar. The communists were still uh, seen as um, outsiders, as aliens who were main, uh, like they were mainly responsible for agitating a docile uh, uh, group of workers. Uh, so yeah, like, uh, I, I feel like uh, th there's probably a link between the, there's actually a huge link between the colonial and the post-colonial time, but uh, for the sake of, uh, I guess, um, theorizing in a way or for the sake of actually stopping somewhere <laughs> or to uh, uh, like um, uh, confine our study, uh, we, we, we put it in certain time frames. But uh, or else, uh, it, it's very, very convenient. Like uh, there's a string of thread and there are similarities, uh, I think, in every epoch. Uh, 
Um, we've gone over slightly on time and I'm going to allow things to continue if that's okay for a few couple more minutes, but um, because you've actually disastrously su suggested that other panels had gone over time, so I don't see why this one shouldn't. But um, but I just wanted to ask Shruti, you, you, you raised the question of, of uh, that, the, the internationalism to nationalism point and I just wondered what your response would be. Yeah, I just wanted to first pick up on the methods question. I'm going to keep it super brief. Um, I think that there's a need for us to come up with new methods of writing intellectual histories. There's no way around it, right? Um, you can't just take um, Skinner on his own terms and, and do this kind of history because I tried and failed, it's not. <laughs> uh, what happens is that um, uh, these women didn't leave um, systematic accounts behind. So uh, as, as I can't remember who, but one of you pointed out, it becomes imperative then to look at lived experiences and action and activism and, and these kinds of things. and blur that theory practice divide to the extent that you think of taxes as being just as big of a of an indicator of where thoughts coming from and where um, these ideas are emerging. And that's extremely important again for the early 20th century. Um, yeah, but just moving on from that a little bit, I choose the 1920 to 50 period for a really specific um, reason. And so 20s is when the when women's um, international women's organizations are really blossoming and 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 they begin to um, have an agenda and to and to start that start to take that moment of the interwar um, period quite seriously and then moving on from there I'm really interested in seeing how in the 50s post independence I, uh, for example the the uh, conference that Gotham mentions I'm interested in seeing if in the 50s um, these women are saying different things about India. Right? Are they are they suddenly starting to think of Indian foreign policy as being a thing, or are, are they starting to think of, um, you know, Indian nationalism as being a, a kind of a finished finished project? Or I'm not sure, right? But for many women, I'm I'm quite certain that the nation state wasn't really the end goal because they they were quite sure that things weren't really getting better for them once we get into uh, kind of the post colonial nation, nation. So it's not really a finished project. I think that um, these kinds of recoveries are really important because we're in a moment in time when um, everything's quite global and it's important to think of some of the historical um, um, genealogies or trajectories of, of some under theorized forms of um, politics, which are which are taking shape. And it's, um, yeah, I, I find that it's quite fascinating that some of the stuff happening around farmers' protests in India or, or around BLM are concerns we've had for over hundreds of years. And obviously um, historians know this quite well, but international relations, some theorists and political theorists tend not to take it quite seriously. So it's, <laughs> you have these conversations with them and tell them that every time, every time something comes up, it's not new. You know, <laughs> these are historically um, situated and rooted um, things. So yeah, but this is a, it's a longer conversation. I don't want to take up too much time. Good note. Um... I think that point around the need to treat practice as a form of thought or, or use practice as a guide to intellectual history, if you like, is, re is really, really important. I think that's a really, really, really good, um, good and important intervention and be great to see how that's sort of pushed and systematized in, in, in all of your work, I guess. Um, other comments from, um, I guess we should start to think about wrapping up um, soon, but um, Sanjana um, and Madeline, anything to add? Um, uh, I just wanted to underline the very important point that just came up of, um, yes, practice, right, as a form of thought. And I also just wanted to say that I think we'd be remiss not to include like the very exciting things that are happening in um, African American intellectual history mm -hmm. right now, which is just so exciting to me um, and really a source of inspiration. Um, uh, I think they've really, there some of those works, um, of course, obviously, like Hartman's Wayward Lives, right, is really like um, charting a path in new and innovative ways um, and really testing the boundaries, um, especially to circle back to the idea of archives and where do we find women's archives. I mean, that's um, some people are going to love Hartman's method there and some people aren't, but it's definitely, um, again, pushing the boundaries and we'll see what comes out of it. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Sanjana, any final comments? Um, anyone else with any um, any final points? Um, um, 
I like the idea of, I think the idea of internationalism from below is really interesting. I mean, there's lots of work that's very scholars have, have, have worked on that. It's um, a little in bits and pieces, but it's a really interesting concept. Um, I slightly wonder, just, just to kind of respond to some of the comments, I, I, I wonder whether whether we just write, I, I think Gordon's right about actually a real change happening, I mean, you know, sort of with, and the, um, you know, a number of comments around the, the institutionalization of, of independent, you know, post-imperial, non-imperial, if you like, political power, kind of, you know, sort of, and, and the way in which it relies upon imperial institutions in many ways. But I do sometimes wonder whether we just look for different things in different moments, and if we're not just not attentive enough to what's going on slightly later, maybe. Um, I don't know. Um, go to. Sorry, sorry, I just was raising my hand. Oh, I thought you had your hand up, but... Um, no, no, uh, I, I did. I, I wanted to just add to what you just said. Yeah, yeah go, go for it. I mean, uh, I mean, I've uh, in European academia, are always, especially on the continent, you're always looking for what they say project possibilities. So, I've been looking at a lot of projects in the last couple of years, and uh, it, it struck me as between subaltern studies, between studies of decolonization and post the post colonial moment, uh, between the sort of work, uh, and on the other side, the sort of work Niall Ferguson does, uh, uh, network analyses, you know, the, the entire spectrum one doesn't see temporally situated, that much temporally situated work, which looks at the exact decolonial moment. Mm. What happens that kind of somehow stymies mm. this great uh, progressive potential? And I don't mean progressive in the sense of socialist or communist alone. I mean, in general, in a social sense, this international, I call it, I mean, I have a phrase that I've been using in a couple of my essays, which is maverick cosmopolitanism. So this, these maverick figures who are traveling between countries, cons, uh, continents, uh, made possible by imperial transport connections, by imperial travel constellations, but not only. I mean, when you see a British Indian steamship that travels by Aden, goes to the Suez, goes to Brindisi, and then finally ends up in Le Havre in France, and then the that, you know, cross the channel back to London. If you look like Tagore's journey from Bombay, Calcutta to Bombay, through Suez to London, these multiple layers of interaction between the metropole and the periphery, somehow with, post, uh, with decolonization, what happens is the nation state development mechanisms take over. So we have we, everywhere, Nkrumah talks of national development, Senghor in Senegal talks of national development, Nehru of course does it, Suikorno does it in Indonesia. So we have these various post-colonial nation state leaders who, whether or not they're pro-West or pro-Moscow, they kind of take a very nation-centered, very top-down development model. And I think there should be work on this, precisely between the 40s and 50s, what's happening across Africa and Asia in these moments. I'm slightly alarmed by how closely this connects with the things that I'm working on right now. But anyway, but uh, so um, no, it's, it's it's also exciting. Uh, but um, um, I, I, a comment there, with there, which is that I think one of the things we need to remember is that um, no one knew what the nation state was going to look like. You know, that actually, the, the that I mean, the point about the the 20s, 30s, and 40s is that there was no no model for a post-imperial nation state. You know, kind of, and there were, in fact there were in some ways there was no model for a nation state at all because the the, the thing that the entity that European historians describe as a nation state was usually an imperial state. I mean, Britain wasn't a nation state. France wasn't a nation state. These these were the metropole the, the, the metro metropoles of empire. So, in that sense, kind of in the in the sort of you know the, the precise nobody knew what 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 this thing that ended up being created looked like, and yet it's completely dominated our historiography since. So, um, I think this I, I I see projects involved in which potentially we could we we might end up. Uh, Continuing this conversation in other formats, I think it's a, it's a very interesting com conversation. Um, shall I, Shivaji, shall I end there um, and um, hand, hand over back to you? But thank you, just, just from my perspective, thank you very much for four absolutely fantastic papers, one absolutely uh, stimulating set of comments, um, and a really interesting discussion that, um, you know, uh, I, I can't think of a better way to spend a Saturday afternoon and um, I haven't been doing any DIY in the last two hours, which is, the main, the, which is what I was doing before. So um, it, in this strange kind of world where we move from, you know, home and work and so forth, just to so, so proximate. But thank you all. It's been, it's been fantastic. So Shabbat. Uh, we have collapsed the binaries between our home and the, and the world.
Um, but uh, I would um, thank, thank first all the presenters. Your presentations were absolutely fascinating, thought provoking. And it's a pity that I couldn't come in today because of um, other organizational demands, but I will be in touch over email bothering uh, you with questions. Gautam, absolutely fantastic comments. And Professor Wilson as well, very insightful. And all of you enriched the discussion of this conference so much that it has been it has been a wonderful learning experience for me as well um thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening and uh, hopefully we will um see all of you some other time in a better non-pandemic circumstances thank you so much it's nice to meeting in real life so anyway, thank you all. thanks